So since I seem to be on a bit of a roll here, I want to make another video about isopotentials. Now this video is going to be relating isopotentials to the Mendelbrot set. In other words, the, the Mendelbrot set is a kind of an isopotential generator. And I will explain that in a minute. But uh, first, I want to do a little review of the Mendelbrot set. And for those who maybe haven't seen my other videos on it, I will um, do a little explanation as to how the Mendelbrot set works. And then we will get into why I think this is uh, the Mendelbrot set is an isopotential generator. So on the left here, we have the Mendelbrot set in its simplest, in the most simplest form. Uh, the black points on the inside um, are the points that belong to the set called Mendelbrot. That is why it's called the Mendelbrot set. The points uh, that are painted black here are um, the set of points named after Benoit Mendelbrot. It's called the Mendelbrot set. And the points on the outside that are painted in white are points that don't belong to the Mendelbrot set. Now the Mendelbrot set literally lives in the complex plane. Here we have, this is a graph of the complex plane. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom out a bit. So the complex plane basically goes on forever. Um, but when you uh, look at the Mendelbrot uh, fractal, this Mendelbrot fractal, you will see um, that it, it sits within this circle here. Now this circle has a radius of two. So the distance from the center of the circle to the, um, to the outside of this circle is two. And this is the boundary condition. This is uh, a boundary condition that we use to when um, when we iterate the points to determine whether they're inside the Mendelbrot set or whether they're outside, whether they don't belong to the set called Mendelbrot. And so um, you can see um, Okay, you can see over here on the right here, we have a real point and we have an imaginary point. So as I move the cursor around, you will see that these numbers are changing. And as these numbers are changing, um, you are seeing the, co the complex number displayed over here. The real component is here and the imaginary component is here. So each point on the complex plane generates a different trajectory. And so that is what I'm going to show you right now. Well, first I'm going to show you that um, there's a the component right here called the number of iterations. So this is the number of iterations um, it takes uh, to uh, escape this boundary condition, this 2.0 boundary condition and of course if you take the number two and square it and square it and square it it's going to go to infinity and so that is why uh, the two the boundary this is the boundary to determine whether a point is going to escape or not so I created a different view here that I haven't shown before and so um, what I'm doing here is I'm showing you that, okay, so this point that I chose, which is actually this point here, it takes two iterations. It takes two iterations before it reaches this boundary condition. And, and you can see I am connecting the points with lines to make it easier for you to see what is going on. So here's a point I'm picking right here which is right here. This is four iterations. So it took one, two, three, four. It took four iterations for it to exit, for it to um, go beyond the radius to, which means that this is now going to um, escape towards in, you know, inf an infinitely far distance from the, the zero, zero of the complex plane which is just right here. So zero, 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 the complex plane is in the middle of this big circle and it's actually right there. 
So each point on the complex plane generates a different trajectory. Okay, so you can see the trajectory, it's a path, creates a different path. So uh, let me pick a different point over here. So you can see that uh, the trajectories are, can become quite complex. They can be simple. So when it's just one iteration, it just escapes. And then when it's two iterate, three iterations, it's one, two, three. And then as you get closer and closer and closer to the, this boundary, which I call the event horizon, or you can just call it a horizon. Okay, so the closer I go to this horizon, this event horizon, the more complex um, this pattern is and the more iterations it takes for this to escape. So this is very much like a, um, a kind of a wacky gravitational uh, effect here uh, in that if, if this was a black hole, as I um, often refer to it, uh, the closer you get to the black hole, the harder it is for the point to escape. So it takes this crazy path and then it finally escapes. And uh, you can see if I go very, very close right here, you can see it takes this complex, crazy path and then it finally escapes. So th that's the points on the outside. Those are the points that, that always escape. They will escape. Um, if the point is painted white, it means that my software detected that it escaped. But what about the points on the inside? What is happening with them? Well, the points on the inside are doing something completely different. They are also taking a path. I'm gonna actually zoom in here because it's gonna make it easier to see. Okay, so, um, so the points on the inside of the Mendelbrot set, the points that belong to the set called Mendelbrot, what they do is they spiral in they spiral in to singularity. Okay, there, this, this uh, trajectory right here is starts here, then it goes here, then it goes here, then it goes here, then it goes here, and it spirals into a tiny, tiny, tiny point right here. So that is why these points never escape. These points never escape. These points never escape because they, were, they are spiraling inward instead of outward. The points on the outside spiral outward. The points on the inside spiral inward. Okay, now if I don't connect the lines, this is what it looks like. When I don't connect the lines, it looks, um, you know, it looks like that. But when you do connect the lines, that's what it looks like. So each of these each of these corners is a point is a point in this trajectory. Now this looks kind of like a, a spiral galaxy is very spiral galaxy ish, um, which I find really interesting. But uh, you know, the point of this discussion is to show you why um, these points don't escape. These points don't escape because um, they are doing something completely different than the points on the outside. The points on the outside always escape. The points on the inside never escape. Okay, so that's the basis of the Mandelbrot set. Um, I'm not going to get into any more detail here. I want to get into the idea of the isopotentials next. So for this discussion, I want to I want to look at a slightly different rendering of the Mendelbrot fractal. And this is exactly the same program, only what I'm doing here is I'm showing um, each consecutive iteration um, in uh, black and white. So one iteration, if you look over here, you'll see the number of iterations and you'll also see the real and imaginary point that I am pointing to, okay? And um, so all the points in here correspond to one iteration. All the points in this white region correspond to exactly one iteration. 
and all the points in here correspond to two iterations and then three iterations and then four iterations and then five iterations and then six iterations. So the differential between each of these is exactly one iteration. So I'm alternating. Uh, all of the odd ones are white and all of the even ones are painted black. And as you can see, there is an accelerating, um, accelerating effect going on, just like in the isopotentials from the uh, magnetic field that, uh, that I've been showing you. And so this is the first approximation, let's call it, of the isopotentials that the Mandelbrot set generates. Now, the next thing I want you to have a look at is uh, I have this uh, escape velocity parameter. So um, you can imagine that, so these are, uh, these regions are, they're basically quantized to the iteration, you could say. So this is quantized to one iteration, this is quantized to two iterations and quantized to three iterations. But um, I can also calculate the in-between potentials. So these are just the first you know, iteration, the first approximation of the isopotentials that the Mandelbrot set is generating. And so if you look at this escape velocity, which is on the right-hand side here, you will see that there is more of a gradual change. There is a gradual change. And so um, there's right in approximately the middle is the one which would be like one iteration, okay? Um, or maybe you wanna call it one volt. We could call this one volt in uh, just as an analogy to the magnetic isopotential. And so this would be one volt, and this would be two volts, and this would be three volts. But there, you can see that there's also everything in between. So you can see that there's a continuum, if you look at the escape velocity, um, which I am referring to as isopotentials, just in analogy to the magnetic isopotential, you can see that um, there is a continuum of potentials, of equal potentials, um, in between each of these um, uh, iteration regions. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you another view. So this is exactly, this is exactly the same program, only I am rendering the Mendelbrot fractal a little differently. Here what I'm doing is I'm actually taking these uh, escape velocity potentials and um, I am mapping them very similar to how I do, how uh, uh, Michael Snyder software does with the magnetic isopotential. So now each of these lines here, each of these contours uh, corresponds to uh, an equal potential, an equal um, escape velocity um, that, the, that the software calculates. And so uh, this is the um, 1.0 approximately um, potential line. So every so wherever I look at this line, you can see that it's a 1.0 something. So it's 1.01, 1.01, 1.01. 1 so there's there's still a little bit of a gradient. Let's I can zoom in. Let's zoom into here. And you can see I've actually divided this into, I divided the equal potential line into equal potential lines. And so I can get a better, you know, reading on it. So this is 1.04 and this is, you know, 1.0. So this is 1.048 and this is 1.042 and this is 1.038. And so there's a gradual change of the isopotential, but um, this uh, line here, this contour here, will have, a, will have the same value, 1.02, 1.02, 1.02. So what I've done here is I've drawn 
the equal potential, the isopotential um, lines, isopotential contours of the Mendelbrot set. And so this is a view that I've been playing around with to uh, see if I cannot, if I can simulate magnetism, uh, something like magnetism with uh, the Mendelbrot set. And so um, I believe that it's possible that I could, um, that I could simulate a kind of a magnetism, a kind of um, pressure gradient. This is literally analogous to the pressure gradient. You can see that the pressure gradient accelerates, it accelerates the closer you get. And of course, as I zoom in, as I zoom into this fractal, the isopotentials continue to get closer and closer and closer together. And this will continue as long as I keep clicking on this and zooming in. So this is of course a very complex series of isopotential lines, but they're exactly analogous to the isopotentials that, um, I, that I showed you with the uh, magnetic isopotentials from Michael Snyder's software. So that is all I wanted to show you today. Uh, again, I, I think that I might be able to do some interesting experiments with this to see if it behaves uh, similarly to the pressure gradients of the um, magnetic field. Of course, the magnetic field gradients are much simpler. These are much more complex, but uh, it, it would be interesting to see if I can um, get this to do something interesting. And so, yeah, that's about it.